okay, guys. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm gonna try to keep it together during this. But I've just waited for so long. I waited so long for Evangelion 4.0. Or 3.0 plus 1.0 or 3.0, which doesn't really make sense because they re-released 3 as Q, but also 3.33 and one is 1.1. 1. 1. So wouldn't it be like 1.1 1. 1 plus 3.3, 3, and then it would be 4.4? 4. <laughs> oh my god, I gotta watch the teaser trailer, guys. Oh my god, Asuka's in this movie! Oh, I didn't know Asuka was gonna be in this movie. I didn't know Shinji was gonna be in this movie either. Wow. Spoilers. Wow, this this animation looks so good. I mean, this animation's amazing. This looks way better than the original series and way better than that shitty movie they put out in 96. Wow. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's that character everybody loves. Hey, they're, they're showing the same scene again. Wow, this is this is amazing. You know what this looks like? This looks like the takedown moves in like a Assassin's Creed game or something like that. Like where like they attack you and you double press the counter button and then you do like the most stock counter grab and like throw them I've ever seen. I'm sure there's some other games that do that. I just can't think of them off of my head off the top of my head. This whole teaser looks like a really shitty, be I mean, beat em up game. I mean, the best trailer ever. I mean, just look at this quality. Oh, it's Ray. I didn't think Ray was gonna be in this. This is epic. Wow. This makes me want to see this movie so bad. Makes me want to see it as much as the trailer for Q made me want to see it. Which is why I saw Q like six years after it came out and only because people made me for a sub goal. I don't know guys, that looked like, that looked like an, an early Xbox 360 game level of quality. Okay, I can't, I can't do anymore. That teaser trailer is a piece of crap and we'll break down why. But this is something I've been meaning to do for a while. And this is to explain why the rebuilds suck and why they're much worse than the original. And I'm not just saying this to be like some hipster guy who says, oh, it, it was back in the day, it was better, and now it sucks. Because I like the Star Wars prequels, at least Revenge of the Sith. I, I Revenge of the Sith is probably my favorite Star Wars movie. I, I'm just throwing this out there to say, like, it, I don't necessarily hate everything that's been rebooted or that anything's had a sequel or a reimagining or anything like that. I really liked the new Blade Runner movie. I thought it was a lot better than the old Blade Runner movie. I even really liked the new Mad Max movie. Just because I know people are going to say, you remember this from the 90s, even though you watched it in the 2000s, and it's just nostalgia. Well, it was only like two years ago that I did my Evangelion commentary series, where I watched the series like twice, once to like make notes and again to do live commentary over the entire thing. So it's not like it's that far off. And I watched End to Heaven Yelly and to do that too. So it's not as if I haven't seen this in a while. I've actually seen the original more recently than I've seen Q. So we're going to get into lots of detail why I hate the rebuilds. But first, I think there's something that... There's that old expression, show don't tell. And I think better than words can possibly describe, I'm going to show you guys the OG trailer for End to Evangelion back in 1997. I remember I, I begged my mother and I kept bothering her until she found it at a local comic store uh, to get me a DVD copy of End to Evangelion, which was difficult and I think expensive and I think it pissed her off, but I got it. And one of the things on the DVD, other than the, the commentary track, which was a lot of fun, was the trailer. And I actually thought the trailer was like one of the best trailers I've ever seen. And we're going to watch it now. And we're going to, I get that that was a teaser trailer. That was not a formal trailer. But do you really think the actual trailer is going to be any better than that? I don't either. So that being said, let's watch the original End to Evangelion trailer. And we'll see if we can pick up any differences in tone 
in focus, etc. Just just remember those images of double tapping the Y button to do the takedown and holding the trigger button while you're running up wall, walls in like the, the Saints Row or the Prototype or Darksiders or any of those 3D roaming whatever. For who would lose? Though full of pain. This intellectual being. Those thoughts that wander through eternity. To paradise, <coughs> swallowed up and lost. In the wide womb of uncreated night. Fate's destruction is also the joy of rebirth. The battle has been joined. With a host of evils under their direct command, the military might of the Cella organization stands poised to wrest control of Nerve's greatest achievement, Evil Unit One. It alone holds the key to humanity's final fate. But the ultimate choice to cast off the world we know rests with one young man. Beyond jealousy and betrayal, beyond hate and desire, beyond pain and death, was the ultimate revelation, the final choice, the end. Manga Entertainment presents the highly anticipated conclusion to the Neon Genesis Evangelion Saga. Mercy, we have begun third impact. The end of Evangelion. Okay, like, I get that that's a cinematic trailer, but it's so much better, and they put so much more effort into this movie. Like, why is the animation so much better in a movie released in 1996 than, like, their Super HD CGI bullshit released in 2020, if it's actually going to come out in 2020, which I, I don't think it will, and that's a good thing, so I'm not going to see it. But you got that. You got the, the awesome quote from Paradise Lost. You got clips from the show. You got... The, the, the classic Evangelion music, you got the um, the motifs. Like that, there's always that, um, that Moon Knight staring up at the moon that's in like every episode. You have the drop of water that's always in like everything. There's just like a lot of references to the show in this. And it's really focusing on what Evangelion was about, at least to me. Now, Evangelion, it, we're going to just, before we get into this, I just have to address something, and that is, do I read too much into this series? Is the Christian and philosophical symbolism just in there to be a troll, or does it have real meaning? And to this, I'm just going to say, and this is something people will often comment on when they're watching reactionary reviews, I take a middle position on the death of the author. So the death of the author is a postmodernist concept that authors don't have any particularly special null insight into their work, but their insight into it is not any more informed than anybody else's. And while I don't think that's the case, I think it's also the case that authors and creators of any kind frequently will channel ideas, maybe metaphysical concepts, culture, tropes. They might put all these things in their work that they're not consciously aware of, and you can still analyze it from that point of view. And with regards to the whole Christian thing, if you're a Christian and you believe that the purpose of the universe and the purpose of humanity was to wait for the coming of Christ to come and save us all and take away our sins, etc., then it would logically make sense that this would be echoed throughout the world. That every hero's journey would have an aspect of this, that every kind of self-sacrificing journey would have an aspect of this i mean it's a universal school of thought for a reason it's something that we believe lies in the hearts of all men and i'm just talking about religion for a minute just because it comes up a lot and i think it's important to kind of state what my perspective is before we get into analyzing this further so to me what made evangelion so good and what made it like the greatest anime of all time was how real it was and you might say, Argent, how can it be real? It's a bunch of biomechanical mechs fighting, well, if you're going by your view, fallen angels who were sealed in Antarctica by the Great Flood. Okay, it's real because unlike a lot of shows, 
and I think this is the issue people have with Shinji. The characters' reactions are a lot more normal. Like, Shinji's first reaction to, like, seeing Unit 1 is he just has, like, a mental breakdown. He's like, what the hell? You want me to pilot that giant purple mech with no instruction? You're not even going to, like, tell me, like, what to do? And you're going to have me go and fight that, that eldritch Cthulhu-esque abomination? And he's 14 years old, and he has a realistic reaction. He, like, breaks down and just kind of loses it. And, and like, if you're watching the show, I think that's the scene where you immediately go, this show is different. This isn't the guy jumping in and saying, oh, this is cool, I got a robot. This isn't the guy doing, like, the lame, oh, I'm too cool for this, uh, and just blow it off. This is a real person, and Shinji feels very much like a real person. Asuka feels very much like a real person, too. At first, you think she's kind of a Mary Sue, that she's this perfect, beautiful, talented girl. But then eventually you kind of see that kind of all of her, I don't know if you want to say her suderde, her unpleasant characteristics. And the way she treats Shinji is all very well deconstructed. There's reasons for all of it. There's very deep emotions going on there. And all the characters in the show, and it's a very tightly controlled show that has very little in the way of filler have these relationships with each other and they're all very like profound and deep but they are all just a little bit dysfunctional they're all just a little bit asymmetrical they're like real relationships nothing in this is just like perfect nobody is as perfect as they seem even gendo ikari who appears to be the bastard king he appears to be like super super like together calm confident and in control is really a broken frightened little child underneath his exterior and it's not just the characters it's the avas themselves they really i think make a lot of use of them being biomechanical unlike something like gundam or, or, or something that effect where they're very clearly robots and they move in kind of blocky ways the avas have a very well animated organic range of motion they do like jumps and sprints and, and they just kind of move in ways that other mechas don't. And I find the show and the movies take a lot of pains to convey... I, I get that Evangelions kind of change size based on the plot, but whenever they move, whenever they hit something, there's always sound effects and shaking, and they try really hard to give you an impression of how big and how powerful these creatures are. And, like, when Unit 1 jumps at something, you get the impression that this massive behemoth is coming towards it. And, the, like, the realism, I think, goes further. And once again, I, I'm what my point being is they're taking the science fiction scenario and they're kind of trying to treat it at least somewhat like what the scenario would be like. Does that make any sense? Anyway, so another aspect of it is you notice all the technology at Nerve is things that would exist in the 1990s when this was made. While there is some advanced stuff, most of it is, like, really primitive hydraulics and like electric motors and lifts and the computers don't look particularly advanced and like they have to use like fairly unsophisticated like pulley systems and stuff to get the evangelians up and running just everything in nerve hq has a bit of a cobbled together just made kind of the, made with whatever resources were available and despite the Evangelions themselves, a lot of the other technology they have is just very 20th century, very much in line with what could be done. Like the um, the guns the Avas use, with the exception of the Positron rifle, are just scaled up versions of normal guns. I don't see any reason why they couldn't do that. The catapults are just hydraulic catapults or magnetically propelled ones. That's certainly possible. But like all the elevators and stuff, that stuff all looks really like fancy and futuristic but you have that kind of stuff at epcot that those things have existed for decades and everything just has that very cobbled together impression and i forget if it's in the tv show or the manga or in both but it's it's implied at some point that most of humanity's resources are going towards this project that parts of the world are starving that the kind of the combined resources of humanity of a of a post second impact humanity are going into this desperate project that like to, to build a single evangelion is like enough to bankrupt an entire country 
that like America could barely afford to build two with all its wealth, that Germany could only afford one. And really, if you think about it, Japan, I think, could only afford to build one, depending on how, if you count the pro, uh, if you count unit zero, the prototype, I think unit one was the only one actually built in Japan. Three and four were built in the U.S., I'm pretty sure. Two was built in Germany, and I don't know if we know where the Ava series was built. But my point is, these these machines took like a decade to build. Some of them aren't even finished by the time the series starts. And they take immense amount of resources. And whenever they get damaged, they always like try to show you how big, like how much repair work has to be done. They mention like this is taking up like trillions of dollars. They, they, they often will say whenever the JSDF tries to fight the angels. What a waste of taxpayers' money. They have to keep rebuilding Tokyo 3, and it gets more and more wrecked and more and more expensive every time. And you really do get this impression that it's kind of this ragtag group of humanity's last hope here at the end of the world, trying to slug it out while trying to deal with these deep emotional issues. And that was what was so great about it, in my opinion, is that these were they were only able to put basically three three Evangelion units together consistently. And that, that took all of humanity's resources and that they could only find like three people in the world who could pilot these. I mean, I guess there's Toji and Kwaru and there probably was some others, but only like two people they could find who could competently pilot them if we exclude Ray. But in the rebuild, you got all kinds of Evangelions. You got like, what is it, Unit 9, Unit 13, Unit 1 and Q isn't even used. It's like they're using it as a power core. There's like some one Mari hijacks in like the second movie. It's like they just like they're these mass produced things. And I get that there's the Ava series, but in in um. And into Evangelion, we can see the Ava series are kind of just mass-produced garbage to a certain extent, because Asuka manages to beat them all. I mean, granted, she doesn't know, really know what she's doing, so she doesn't destroy the rest two organs and confirm the kill. But if she had have had a longer battery, she could have killed them all. They were inferior copies, and the Ava series, God knows how long that took to build. And I think a lot of the technology to build them came from angels that were harvested after the invasion began. But yeah, now we have all kinds of angels. I mean, in, in the second movie, one of the biggest FUs to the audience was when they mentioned the Vatican Treaty. And they're like, the Vatican Treaty is you can only have three Avas in one country at a time. And I'm like, they have more than three? Really? We're, we're at, the, we're at the, the end of humanity, and we, we can't have more than three Avas under the control of the Japanese government. Really, this is what we're going to squabble about. And, and it is interesting because there is an interesting aspect to the Avas as being more powerful than a nuke. Because they can take a nuke to the face and be completely fine. And personally, that, that was my fan theory as to why they had the five minute battery. Is because they were so powerful that limiting them to five minutes without external power makes it almost impossible for them to be used as an offensive weapon of war. But it's just stuff like that, and there's just so many of them, and, and, like, I don't think any of them have their own backstory. They don't even, like, attempt to address whose soul is in them, who the designated pilots are. And, and just Mari. Why the fuck is Mari in this? Who likes her? She was just put in to appeal to another fetish. Okay, so we got the, um, the red-headed Suderde. We have the creepy blue-haired girl. And then we have the, the... The librarian quirky fetish fuel, I guess, is what Mari's for. And they just added her in. And it's like, okay, so we got Ava's coming out everywhere. We got all this, like, super advanced technology stuff that we didn't have before. The plot makes even less sense. Like, it's, it's hard to even, like, know where to start. Like, in, in Q, they have the, what is it, the, the S something or other Vunder? They're like super flying command whale ship with guns. Like you didn't see anything nearly that fantastical in the original. When, when that stuff actually happened, it was because of the angels. Humanity. So like what we're supposed to accept is that humanity went bankrupt to build like, I guess the original Ava series was, was five units, one through f zero through four. 
but they were somehow able after the third epoch, the second apocalypse, to build this giant flying ship. Why? I don't get it. How how does Gendo have a like a factory that mass produces them? Like, n none of this makes any sense, and it's just a big fuck you. Like, Unit 1 is supposed to be by far the most powerful Ava, and it does nothing in Q. It just sits in, like, a case somewhere, and they use it as a fucking power supply. And that's, like, I don't know, that's some of it. And the characters, they just butchered. Like, I don't even know, like, they changed Asuka's name from Asuka Langley Shoryu to, like, Asuka Langley... Uh, whatever Shikigami or whatever they changed her name to. I'm like, why did they need to change her name? Like, I, I just, I didn't really get it. And they seem to have changed her character and her backstory. She seems a lot more mentally stable now. She just seems like kind of more of a traditional Suderde than she was in the original. I think they took out the whole, like, backstory thing. As, as far as I can remember, and I, I looked it up before this video, I think they took out, like, the whole traumatic backstory thing about her mother, like, thinking a doll was her and hanging the doll and her mother losing her soul. And, like, Asuka's character arc is one of the most fascinating, but fascinatingly tragic in all of fiction. I really liked her character arc a lot. Um, she's one of my favorite characters of all time. I think part of the reason people like her so much is they can really relate to her. Uh, kind of her internal problems. But she's just kind of a generic Suderde now. I never got the impression watching the original series that Rei was a love interest for Shinji. Now that might be a really weird thing to say because it's just kind of accepted face value. I always got the impression that she was just supposed to be really weird, creepy, and disturbing. And that the waifu thing was just something that came about later as an unintended consequence. Like, if anything, it was kind of an inversion. Like, that whole scene where, like, Shinji falls over and gropes her. I, I feel like that was kind of supposed to be an inversion or a deconstruction of, like, that scene in other animes. And to show how freaky Rei was. But, like, now Rei is just Shinji's canonical love interest. I think. Or she was in the second one. But now she isn't. It just, everybody's, like, super different. And, and I'm fine if they want to take the show in, like, a different direction. And, and they want to, like, do something different with these characters. But they just, they just don't. They just don't do anything useful to them. They don't do anything that adds to the lore. They don't do anything that adds to their personalities. Nobody gets a character arc anymore. Like, an end to Evangelion is literally Shinji becomes Jesus. He takes all the sins and hatred of humanity into himself. He sees everything that ever has been about man and everything that ever will be about man. And he decides, as Jesus did, that humanity is worth saving. And it's the end of his character arc. It's the end of his, it's him finally kind of coming to terms with himself. After everything he's been through, after all the hardship he's faced, after all the interpersonal battles he's fought, he's finally reached the end of his road and he's become an adult and he's become a, he's become the messiah that he was always supposed to be. And you just don't have any of this in, in, in the reboot. Like it's it just it just feels like it's like to call it fan fiction is an insult to fan fiction, because I read a lot of fan fiction. A lot of fan fiction is actually more in character than what the the author winds up doing with it, bizarrely enough. I don't know what the goal with this was. If it was supposed to be, like, fan disservice. Like, I can go through this. I can explain why Q, which is Evangelion 3.0, you cannot redo, is one of the worst movies ever made. I can explain why nothing about it makes any sense. And it doesn't not make sense in, like, a mindfuck way. Like, uh, I'm sure there's something really profound going on here. It makes sense in, like, uh, you know what it's like? You're eating a, you're eating a burger, and, and a guy walks over to you, and he's like, oh, my God, look at that. And you turn, and then he slaps the burger out of your hand. That that That's what these movies are. And they just shit over the original. And once again, I'm not saying this is like that I'm a hipster or everything that's new is necessarily bad, but these are really bad. So let's just go through this trailer. Let's just go through it. I'll explain like just why this sucks. 
And like at the end of the day, that's what the problem with this is. It's lost what made the original show good. The realism, the characters, the feeling that it was this like band of misfits at the end of the world trying to take down this impossible foe. It wasn't like Ava's coming out of the ass and like generic shonen plot lines or whatever. I don't know. Let's watch this. Is this supposed to be like a reference to just previous instances where Shinji was, was curled up? Like, why are we even showing this? I'm pretty sure this was in the previous movie, wasn't it? Does Shinji have a love interest now? Because I thought it was Rei, but then Rei died. So is Asuka his love interest? Or is... No, Kwaru's dead for some reason. Look at how bad this looks. Like, what the fuck is that? What is this giant, like... Like, what is that thing? You never saw anything like that in the original series. And you saw, like, crazy stuff. You saw the giant naked ray. You saw these giant crosses, etc. But that was always, like, part of a specific incident. You just didn't see this random shit. And then why are there AT fields all over the place? A AT fields are, like, a very specific, unique, powerful thing that only Avas and Angels can generate. I mean, people technically have them, but yeah. Oh, it's Mari. Oh, man. She has her, like, crappy... What are these? Oh, it's some more of those, like, shitty mass-produced ones. Once again, you have the double tap... Um... Takedown move. No, that's what it reminds me of. It's Deus Ex. It's the takedown moves in Deus Ex is what that is. That looks exactly like the Adam Jensen takedown moves in Deus Ex. Actually, here, let me just, let me just pull that up. Okay, here we go. It literally is exactly like the takedown. Yes, it's exactly like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> I think that's the exact move that he, that Asuka, or Mary, Mari used of this. Like... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay guys i'm i'm all right i'm all right i just have to get through this shitty trailer okay let's go through what, like what the fuck is that like ungodly abomination like okay so we got asuka dragging him okay we got a picture of ray um like what the why does it have bandages on it? What is that, like, fucking weird ring thing that they have? And, of course, Mari has to have a a pink Ava because pink is for girls. And I get it that Asuka had a red one, but whatever. What is she even shooting at? Who are they even fighting? Are the angels still there? Is this nerve? Didn't Gendo kill Sele in the last movie? So, like... What, what What's even going on? Wow. That was amazing. I think somebody released the last, like, the first ten minutes and I refused to watch it. I refused to watch Q. And to end this off, I just wanted to share a, a, um, a memory with you guys. I actually can't really remember when I watched, uh, Evangelion 1.0. Um... You are not alone. I remember thinking it was, like, okay. I thought it was kind of an inferior copy of the same TV show, but it didn't, like, offend me or bother me or anything. Evangelion 2.0, though, I was, like, one of the most excited I've ever been for a movie. I was beyond excited. I got to see one of the first screenings in North America. God, it's been so long. I can't remember if it was even dubbed or not. But it was one of the first screenings in North America. And I saw it, and I thought it was, like, the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And then, like, as I got older and I went back and I rewatched the original, it started to get worse and worse and worse. And then Q came along. Then then You Cannot Redo came along. And I took one look 
at the trailer for that, and I took one look at the plot summary, and I said, I want nothing to do with this. This isn't even Evangelion. This is some... I don't know what the fuck this is. And Q was, like, the one of the most disappointing things ever. I'm trying to think of something that was as disappointing as Q. Skyward Sword, I guess. I didn't have high hopes from Skyward Sword, but how bad Skyward Sword was is, I guess, kind of close. That or how much CNC4 sucked. So... I'm not going to watch this movie. It's not a principles thing. I just have no desire to see it. It's like the Netflix Evangelion. I just, I don't see why I should subject myself to it. Maybe I'll read a plot summary and see like what kind of nonsense they came up with. But the, not my Evangelion. Not my Game of Thrones. Soriano. I like to conclude in the words of George W. Bush. Fool me with 1.0, shame on you. Fool you with, with 2.0, we can't get fooled again until we got fooled by Q. Fool me 3.0 plus, plus 1.0 or 3.3 plus 1.1, we can't get fooled again. Anyways, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this long, incoherent rant. God bless you all. This is Argent. We must ascend.